So I'm here uh, actually on behalf of, uh, of AIRWEC, of the European Research Initiative of CLL, together with COSTAS. And I think as a um, group of scientists, of clinicians, I think it's extremely important to have very close collaboration and actually side to side with patient advocacy groups. And I think if you look to hematologic malignancies, you can actually divide them in, in uh, very aggressive forms and the more chronic forms like CLL. And I think also there is a spectrum on um, what the role of a patient-doctor relation is. I think if you have an acute leukemia, there is not so much of a debate. It's just you need treatment within uh, 24, maybe 48 hours. There's not so much time to discuss all the treatment options. You also don't have that many treatment options still, unfortunately. But if you look to a disease like CLL, it's more, the doctor is much more a coach than a really treating physician. You have very long periods of time, so you don't give any treatment, that you just coach the patient and Actually, you go together with the patient to all his life cycles, and the moment that you start a treatment or restart a treatment uh, or maybe stop treatment, that are really uh, decision makings that you do together. And I think I'm very actually fortunate that this meeting is actually taking place because the relation between the doctor and the patient should indeed be very equal and should be more like a coach, an advisor, than more than a really treating physician telling the patient what to do. And uh, before I start my presentation, another thing that I think it's really more and more important is that, uh, specifically in the Netherlands, um, patients and doctors are very closely together working on more national uh, topics. And one of the things is that the, all the new drugs that I think we're very excited about and we, we a lot of hope also means that they cost a fortune. And it also means that the government, although in the Netherlands, uh, because of uh, right-wing governments that we had for the last uh, years, we have this uh, market value price sharing in, 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 uh, in, in, in clinics. And so the government kind of retracts from all negotiations between money. Unless it's going to be a lot of money, then they can uh, step in again. And it happened now in the Netherlands that abrutinib actually in the first line is uh, very much debated because it's too much money. And it's really important now that doctors together with people like Jan, um, having really having the face to the minister telling what to do and what not to do because if we don't collaborate on this uh, then i think uh, other people that are not that well knowledge about the disease will make a lot of decisions and actually i think the patient and the doctor together should be in control so having said that i want to start with more the the, the medical session about uh, so i was asked to tell something about when to watch and uh, to wait or maybe when to treat so to do that, I uh, give a short introduction on CLL. I think uh, some things are also a bit of a recap from yesterday, but I think it's important. A recap is always very nice because if you have a recap, you uh, have the feeling that you were a very good listener yesterday and then you get maybe some new information from me. So the interesting thing is that in this uh, moment, the, there's really a lot of new drugs are coming to us. You have, instead of only one chemotherapeutic, we have now four retrogest chemotherapeutic for CLL. We have three different antibodies. We have uh, two, uh, so in, in yellow means that they are already in the, in the clinic and in purple means that they are coming very soon to us. Uh, kinase inhibitors. And we have, also have uh, therapies that actually involve the T cells. So it's not really killing or working with the CLL cells, but activating your own immune system to, uh, to kill your CLL cells. So there's really a lot of, uh, of new therapies coming to us. And I think it's a really good time now to really think when should we treat, what should we give, and, and how should we give it. So I have divided my session in four, uh, four uh, topics. How does CLL typically present? What are the complications of CLL? What is the natural cause of the disease? And when should we treat? Uh, so to demonstrate that, I will present a, a typical case of mine, but I think a lot of people here who are also patients or no patients, it's uh, probably very, um, very familiar. I think what I will tell, I had a, uh, a man of 72 years old who went to his general practitioner because of hypertension. And he did notice some fatigue last month. He had a little bit of slow deterioration of his condition, but it was really a little bit under the radar for him. And uh, this GP was a very active GP, was a new one who just came from medical school and from their training. So he thought, well, hypertension is one thing, but I need to do a blood test on him anyway, because why shouldn't I? And so he did physical examination, found some very small lymph nodes in the neck region, did lab, found a, uh, actually a normal uh, blood levels, normal AGB and normal thrombocytes, but his leukotimes times went eight times too high. And for a GP, this is really an alarming sign. So immediately 
He calls the, the referring hospital, tell the, intern, the internist that he probably has a case of severe leukemia on his clinic. So what normally happens then also in the Netherlands is the next day you are seen by a hematologist in either a, a larger uh, non-academic hospital or an academic hospital and it's a bit more uh, rigorously done. So you get again a physical examination and the hematologist on call found enlarged lymph nodes uh, on not only his neck but also in his axilla and his groin. His spleen is two fingers below the, below the costa, so it's enlarged, and he repeats blood exam. But what he does is not only looking at the numbers, but he's also looking under a microscope, and he sees this typical uh, smear cells, very typical for CLL, but he also does flow cytometry. So with uh, fancy new techniques, what probably has been discussed yesterday also, looking to all the different uh, proteins that are expressed on the cell by a flow cytometer, with, uh, he does that with uh, antibodies that are labeled. Uh, he found actually that this patient has a typical CLL with uh, a CD5, CD19, and CD23 expressing uh, B cell malignancy. And despite this whole panic on the first 48 hours of the patient, the doctor tells him, well, it's CLL, you have a leukemia, and we, let's make an appointment for an, in three months, and then we see how everything goes. And that part, and that's, I think, extremely important for patient advocacy uh, groups, that is the most difficult part for the patient, actually, that you're almost comforted by the doctor that you just have a CLL. Well, for the patient, this WW treatment, what we call it, watchful waiting, is actually worryful waiting if you don't explain it very well. And that's what this session is about is why are we allowed to do this worryful waiting? And the problem that I always face is that although CLL is the most common leukemia in the Western world, Everybody has a, uh, a neighbor or a family member who has either colon carcinoma or breast carcinoma. And the whole story there is that everybody really thinks that if I didn't go to the doctor uh, today, but maybe a week later, everything would be completely different. And then you have a CLL and then the doctor tells you, well, see you again in three months and, and I hope everything will be okay at that time. So I think after this talk, you should agree with me that that is the correct treatment, but it is something that is may maybe the most hard uh, thing in the first uh, communication with the patients to really tell why this is good or not. So to go a little bit back to what are we looking at actually. So a CLL cell is a cell that actually um, derives from uh, B cells, but it's not that simple. It's not for breast carcinoma, again, or for colon carcinoma, we very much know exactly which normal cell gets malignant and where it goes wrong. And for CLL, it's a bit more complicated because this B cell, this lymphocyte, it has many different stages until it completely matures. So it comes out of the bone marrow. Maybe you have another laser pointer that's more active? Yeah, I know, but it doesn't, oh, it doesn't work really little. Okay. So um, the lymphocyte, it's born in the, in the bone marrow. And after it matures, it goes to the blood, but it stays very short in the blood, and then it goes to your lymph node, for instance, the uh, axilla. And there, actually, it stays as a, a naive, uh, naive lymphocyte, just doing nothing, waiting till it uh, comes into contact with a specific antigen, a specific bacteria or virus that actually activates a specific lymphocyte. So if it comes to bacteria, if you um, have an accident with a needle in your finger, then uh, macrophages will eat up this, um, this bacteria, will bring it to your uh, axilla, to the first lymph node that will pass, and there they will present the bacterial antigens to the, to the lymphocytes. And then you get a very specific reaction, so the lymphocytes are going to be mature, they're going to develop into plasma cells, and plasma cells are actually the same cell as started here, but now it changes and it is going to make antibodies against the same bacteria, that's how vaccination works. But that's not only the thing that happens, what also happens is that some of the cells will become memory cells. And those memory cells, what it will do, it, it will now have a memory for this bacteria. And as soon as this bacteria comes again, you don't need to go this whole uh, development, but you can immediately, from these memory cells, make new plasma cells. And what has been a debate for 30 years, and now I think we are almost there, but still uh, every year you have new papers, what really is now the source of the CLL cell, but we really think it's kind of a cell that's in between this uh, development of a antigen experienced cell, which is going to be in the blood uh, as a memory cell. And that's why that's also always difficult to explain to patients. Do I, because patients always ask, do I have a leukemia, do I have a lymphoma? And actually you have both. CLL is maybe officially part of lymphoma because it's a B cell problem, but because those memory cells are actually very much equipped to be happy and to be alive in the blood, 
And also in the lymph node, it's kind of a combined disease. It's a disease of lymph nodes, but also of leukocytes in the blood. And so what happens is those cells slowly proliferate, so you get an increased uh, proportion of CLL cells in the blood, and only later on those cells are also going to occupy the bone marrow, giving late uh, effects of um, bone marrow failure. And so the clinical behavior actually is in many times it's the patients represented that went to the GP first, which has, doesn't have any symptoms uh, in the beginning, but slowly in years or in months, patients develop enlarged lymph nodes because of this accumulation of lymphocytes, enlarged spleen and liver, and so-called B symptoms, fatigue, night sweat, and fever, because these active immune cells, they were immune cells when they were normal, and they're still immune cells when they are malignant, can produce all those cytokines and all those other factors that actually give this kind of um, yeah, immune kind of, um, of, of, of symptoms. Uh, so, what's very important is, uh, as you explain your patient, is that you can have two types of complication. Just having a CLL, although you don't have any clinical symptoms yet, and although there is no real need for treatment, you can still suffer from complications. Most important, it's uh, autoimmune diseases. So, because if you have a disturbed B cells, you make uh, misfolded, you make wrong anti antibodies, and actually you you guide your normal uh, antibody system to, uh, in a wrong way, which makes you very vulnerable for developing autoimmune diseases, specifically autoimmune uh, anemia and autoimmune thrombocytopenia. So you can have no disease, no lymph nodes at all, but you can have a problem with severe thrombopenia because of this autoimmune phenomenon. And the other complication is um, that you can have, uh, oops, sorry, low levels of immune globulins. So all patients with CLL have a slow deterioration of their immune globulins, making them more vulnerable to infections. It's unrelated to disease, to the staging of the disease. It just happens also if you have a stage zero. Then you have also complications which are do depend on the disease stage, and that specifically has to do with infiltration of the marrow. So later in life, uh, later of the development of the disease, the CLL cells actually start in the lymph node and in the blood, also occupy the bone marrow, which will give anemia, which will give low platelets, resulting in bleedings, and will give neutropenia, resulting in infections. Uh, what's very important and makes it even more difficult for me, but also for patient advocacy groups, is that it's really a very mixed kind of patient you will see. You have a... Uh, uh, 30% approximately who will have CLL and who will never suffer from their CLL and actually on a, uh, an old age will die uh, not because of CLL but just having a CLL which has never been clinically relevant and die from other natural causes like, like um, cardiovascular problems. Then you have a small group that has very aggressive disease from the onset and although it's officially a CLL it much more behaves like an aggressive lymphoma. And the largest group actually is a group that has a medium of five years without symptoms, so you can just do your watch and waiting policy, but that will follow then by uh, progression and complications, both of the disease, but majority also because of the treatment that we give. So something that you have in, to take in mind uh, why we think we, don't, we still don't need to treat all patients in the beginning is that there is a big difference between cure and between control, and that is something that really is in our doctor's minds, but it may be good for discussion if that's the same, uh, the same rules apply actually to what we think uh, uh, you, you agree on. So in cure, if you, have, uh, if you can cure a disease, then important is the disease itself is a target. You aim for a complete eradication of the disease, and because you have a chance to cure, we as doctors accept a very high toxicity. Acute leukemia patients, you, if you look to children who have acute leukemia, you give them everything what is in us power to kill the disease. And for a few months, we don't care so much, we don't care maybe at all about the quality of life of the patients because we have a chance to cure uh, the patients. And so we accept a very deep temporary fall in quality of life. And of course, if you cure, treatment should be temporary. You cannot cure patients with lifelong treatment. If you aim for disease control, then not the disease is the target, but disease activity is the target. So you aim for having control of the activity of the disease. By definition, you don't go for eradication of the disease. Toxicity is how you treat the patient. So you're going to treat the patients as long as the toxicity is bearable. Uh, 
you aim for a quality of life that hardly get affected and treatment might be prolonged. And so far we think that for CLL we're pretty much on this side and that's all our clinical decision making actually goes by these definitions. So then the question of course is, is CLL now a curable disease? Well, what we do know, I don't know if you have seen this slide yesterday, but after FCR, uh, the, a few years ago, or maybe last year even, we thought that all patients with FCR, although it's a very active treatment, will have a relapse at one day. But then came a very interesting study from uh, Davide Rossi, who is now in Switzerland, was in Italy at that time, and he divided the patient in different subgroups, and I think Costas explained a lot about it yesterday, about the different subgroups. But if you look to this curve, it's pretty interesting. So the yellow is kind of the mean that we normally know. So if you give FCR, then the uh, PFS slowly goes down in all patients. And if the PFS goes down, if the progression-free survival goes down, that means that every year you didn't have a relapse, the next year you have a higher chance to get a relapse because eventually all patients will relapse. Now you can see that in this line, I think this is the most important of this slide, this is the uh, hazard of progression. So if you have high-risk disease with P53 mutated disease. If you didn't have the disease in the first year, you have an extremely high chance and the chance go higher and higher uh, until you have the disease back. And the interesting thing is that you have this subgroup with uh, IGVH mutated disease and now it's a subgroup, but I think Costas will agree with me, but also this group will be divided in more and more subdivisions. Um, but what seems to be the case in this subgroup is that instead of that the curve goes down and down, it kind of stabilizes here. And also, if you look then to this curve, which is more important, I think, you see that in the first few years, if you didn't have a progression, your chance of progression increases. But if you didn't have progression after four to five years, it goes down again. But really is maybe the first sign that this treatment for a specific subgroup of patients can cure your patients. Um, we do have a cure for CLL. We do know how to cure patients, and that's with an allo stem cell transplantation. And what you can see here is that uh, you have seen an overall survival and a progression-free survival that is the same, meaning that if you have treated the disease, that the overall survival is equal. Um, but you also see that with allotransplant, you have a pretty high risk of uh, treatments uh, of treatment-related mortality instead of disease-related mortality. And this was all retrospective. So last few years in the Netherlands, we did a prospective trial of allotransplant with a regimen that's what the problem is allotransplant is that if you do a retrospective analysis, all patients had different treatments before. You just put them all together because they had at one stage same, similar treatments. So we did a prospective trial where all patients got a DHEP regimen, which is a kind of an aggressive chemotherapy regimen, and then they go for transplant. And indeed what we see is there might be a plateau also here. Uh, you see that a lot of patients also, the curve goes down because the, uh, before transplant already, they might, might turn out to be unfit for transplant because the, the, the treatment before is already um, too toxic. And uh, you see that also there, an overall survival is reached with a plateau here, but you're paying considerable price for that. So if you think again of CLL and cure versus disease control, I think you have a chance maybe to cure patients, but with the current treatment that we have it, it's such a high risk, it's such a high burden that it's for only, I think, available, and you should only use it for a very small group of patients. So then the question is, okay, we can wait for treatment for years and years and, and, and do disease control and at the end give something that might cure them, but if it may be the case that immediate treatment, that, does, that might result in a better survival. Well, so far, it has only been tested for chemotherapy, uh, and there have been quite some trials in the late 70s and the 80s that studied actually patients that got immediate treatment versus prolonged treatments. What was seen is that there was no advanced survival in patients with immediate treatment. Actually, on contrary, more patients had problems 10 years after treatment because they developed this uh, um, other, other malignancies like myelodysplastic syndrome because of the treatment we gave at that time. So because of this trial so far, it has never been approved that immediate treatment is, uh, is the good thing to do. Question is, with all the new drugs that also have been discussed yesterday, uh, is that still valid or not? And I think it's a valid question to ask. If you maybe, if you very early on now on a, on a subgroup of high-risk patients immediately start treatment, do you maybe then cure the disease or at least have long-time disease control? And so the German study group has different trials studying actually uh, patients without any treatment indication but with high-risk disease. 
and uh, they treat them. So there have been a study with FCR or watch and wait. And I think for FCR, we still have to see that results, but they're doing the same trials now with all the new drugs that we get to see indeed, maybe with all those new drugs, is there a way of curing the disease if you treat very early on? So far, we don't have the answer. And so far, there is not there is any sign that immediate treatment will uh, give a prolonged survival than uh, treatment after symptoms. So conclusion is that currently there is no reasonable curative option at first line. And so treatment should be aimed at control of symptoms, prevention of disease-related complications, and restore quality of life. And we still use the algorithm that was developed by the IWCLL, um, that is, so when to start treatment, because quality of life is very much a, a subjective manner. And for one patient, it can be something completely different than the other, but we should really prevent that if you come to the Netherlands, to me, I will give you treatment for a complete different reason that if you go to Greece and you go to Costas and he treats you for other reasons. So together in the community of CLL, we made agreements. When do we think a disease is active? And there are a lot of definitions that go, don't go all through, but it's, we try to define something that actually is a gray zone. So if you have evidence of bone marrow failure, if you have a lot of B symptoms, if you have very massive splen uh, uh, splenomegaly, if you have very much enlarged lymph nodes, but also for lymph nodes, if you don't need to wear a tie uh, every day to your work, you don't bother so much to have a big lymph node, but if you does have to wear uh, a tie, then you get more complications. So it's still a gray zone, but we try to make that more an objective manner. Also, if you have complication of these autoimmune diseases that don't react to normal therapy, and this is actually a group of patients that doesn't have symptoms, but we know they will develop symptoms very soon. So if you have a rising uh, leukocyte number of more than 50% over a two month period, or a lymphocyte doubling of uh, less than six months. And uh, so actually, if you summarize this very busy and complicated slide, it's actually all symptoms that affect or will affect quality of life, that should be a reason to treat. And then, of course, which treatment is also important? The, the, uh, I don't know if you recognize this picture, but this is actually how chlorambucil was detected. I don't know if you know that story. But you had a, um, so chlorambucil was actually detected in the Second World War. This is an American warship in the harbor of Bari in, uh, in Italy. And uh, they had a secret, uh, it, was, uh, it was actually secret what it was doing there, but it was bombed by the Ital Italians or the Germans. And then a very big uh, cloud of smoke came from the ship. And actually this was um, a mustard gas. And uh, all terrible things happened to the patients, uh, to, to, me, to, the, to the people of Bari. But after the war, America sent um, researchers. And that what they actually found is that the people, if they died, they died not of just random symptoms, but they all had a lymphocyte depletion. And then people start to think, well, if we give the same kind of mustard gas, but then in a very more smarter way than how well, we did it here, of course, then maybe we can actually get your lymphocytes down without doing too much harm. And that's how chlorambucil was developed. Uh, so you think of smart therapies, this is maybe not too smart, but it works very active. But maybe if you should look to the disease as a, in a different uh, scheme. So I always like to take as an example for patients, a racing car. So this looks very scary, this racing car. If you would see this next to you, uh, in a normal car on the street, it would be a bit scary. But we know that those cars actually are not that robust if they are on the circuit and they maybe go for four or five rounds, they're going to the, 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 the tires will, will uh, go away and, and it will get smoke from it. And the reason that those cars can survive is because at the right time they go into their pit stop, there they get completely surrounded by supporting uh, persons and they completely revive the car. And the same actually we think now is happening in CLL. So the CLL cells look a bit scary. It's not a normal B cell, it has CD23, it has CD5, it has some other features, but it uh, actually will, will be destroyed in the blood if it doesn't go back to the lymph nodes environment, to the pit stop, where it gets completely um, covered by a lot of normal cells, giving a lot of signals that revive the cell. And if you look to this more from a magnifying glass, you can actually see how many new options we have for treatment, much smarter actually. So if you look to the nucleus of the cell as kind of the control room where everything is dictated what the cell will do, then you can say that it very much depends in this pit stop on a stimulus from the outside, from the pit stop. The stimulus should be detected by a receptor. The receptor should give the signal to the headquarters here, to the 
um, to the control room, to the nucleus, and then the nucleus will tell, well, which proteins to switch on and which proteins to switch off. And because we much better understand now how this works, we also have much better ways of treatment, treating patients. So not, I don't go too deep into all those different treatments, but you can influence the stimulus. For instance, you can influence T cells in the lymph node environment with lenalidomides. You can do receptor blockade by all the antibodies. You can inhibit signaling to the nucleus by kinase inhibitors. And you can inhibit survival proteins by drugs like uh, venetoclax. Problem is that all those drugs are extremely expensive and that's really the, the next, I think the next decade we will, together with patients, have a lot of discussions on how to give this much smarter drugs in a clever way. The last thing I want to say, and I think that's extremely important, I think my time is almost up, is about how to, oh, it's still in Dutch, sorry for that, but it's how to deal with the disease. And I think what is most important is that you can have a disease, but you can also become a disease. And I very much, I very often see that patients actually become a disease. And specifically for CLL, when you have periods that you have a good quality of life, you should actually, and it's very easy to say for me, don't having the disease, but you should have the disease, but you should, you, your whole system should not be the disease. And of course, I think you all know people from your surroundings that as soon as you call them, they, the first thing they will tell is about their disease. And what happens is that patients of a family will retract a little bit because it's, it, you can do it for a few times, but at some point it's very difficult for, for, for the surrounding to deal with patients that can only talk about their disease anymore. So I think it's a very important role for doctors, but maybe more so for patient advocacy groups to tell your patients that, well, you can have the disease, but if you are completely in the water, you really become the disease, that all the reasons that we treat for control of life doesn't work because you don't have a good quality of life if you can switch this uh, being the disease from having the disease. So you should actually have the disease, you should be on the surfboard and not uh, next to it, and really try to enjoy life as much as is possible in the periods that the control is very good. So um, one thing if you people want to look at it, it also has an English part, is uh, we had kind of a, um, we tried to communicate with our patients in the Netherlands by uh, different means. We have Hematon, but Jan can tell much more about it, but we also have in our research group in the AMC, we try to have, give a monthly newsletter to all patients digitally to tell them about all the research progress we make. Thanks. Uh, Alan, thank you very much. That was very fascinating and uh, very concise. I've written down many things where I could throw many questions at you, but could, please, from the floor, are there any questions for Alan? Yes, Peter. Not a question, but a comment. I really like the slide that had the, co the control room and the different um, ways that new uh, therapies address, um, address the disease. That was the best I've seen of that kind of uh, uh, depiction. Oh, thanks. Anybody? Um, Alan, I do have one question because I, I, I was looking at your discussions around the difference between cure and control um, and it's only recently that we become aware that with the long-term data that the population with mutated immunoglobin uh, could possibly uh, have a, uh, uh, there'd be a curative solution there. What, one of the questions uh, the, 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 so the question really is, is that, and also there's the allo, allogenic uh, stem cell population. From what I gather, these are quite small minority populations. Are you able to give us an indication of how, how large is the population uh, that would receive uh, FCR that are in the mutated group that are likely to get a potential cure? Yeah, I think, and it costs us not better than me, but I think it's almost 50% of your population that actually have uh, mutated FCR, uh, mu mutated immune globulins. Agree. So, considering that you have to uh, be medically fit, yeah, that makes sense. And also, uh, I mean, talking about who is going to benefit from FCR. Okay. Now, uh, we've made an estimate in a very large series, and uh, amongst all CLL patients in need of treatment. Those who are A, medically fit, and B, carry mutated immunoglobulin genes without any other bad prognostic 
features are no more than 13 percent. Thank you. Thank you. So the take home from that is that, the, and I think we learned this yesterday, that the majority population within CLL, the average age of diagnosis is 72. People are living with age-related comorbidities and fitness issues, so they're not able to tolerate FCR. So that's part of the reason justifying why that. So there no, is no, a no, small no, population. Yeah, that's yeah. true. But one thing I want to say about your about the, um, the T cell therapy, which actually in other transplant is actually a very crude way, an extremely crude way actually to do a T cell therapy. And I think it's, it, we have showed it worked, but we showed that this has a very big price. But I think with the development now that we are more and more able to generate your own T cells and prepare them for treatment with CARs or with B specific antibodies or with checkpoint inhibitors, that could actually be a whole new wave of treatment options which might maybe uh, could think of cure. Problem is that in CLL, those T cells are not very functional. They're actually, they have an exhausted phenotype. And we, but also a lot of other groups, actually do research to understand why that happens. And if you can get your own T cells fit again, then you might have all the um, positive things of a, of a T cell transplant without all the troubles that you get from allogeneic T, T cell transplant. So I think that's not for now. That's, I think the, the maybe f now and 10 years from now, a lot of research will be done on autologous T cells to see how we could prepare those for treatment. You Thank you. Question? Right? question? Yes. Hi, Charlotte. Sorry, I couldn't yeah. see you behind the screen. Please. I have a question, actually, about um, so how you concretely collaborate with patient organization and especially Ematon in the Netherlands to make sure that this patient organization is part of the team around the car you showed on your slides and to support patient together. Yeah, so maybe Jan can also uh, add to that, but I think it's still not good enough. But what I always do in their first meeting with the patient, and I, because I'm a, I work in a referral hospital, I see, I think 80% of the patients I see are actually uh, second opinions from other hospitals. And in the first talk, I always say, well, after we meet each other, you have to become a member of Hematon. I think it's for free, but I'm not sure. Free? Yeah. So I, I advise them to go to the website to become a member, and I say, well, you can be... And a lot of people always say, no, but I don't want to be with patients and discuss all my, all my everything. I, it's, it's good enough that I come to you, but that's it. And I say, but you have three kind of different levels. You can be a very much a consumer. You just get a magazine. You can look on the website, and, and that's it. You can go to the meetings that we have. Uh, and now we're going to have them done three yearly, right, with, uh, to see the patients. And you can only come to the kind of expert talk and don't go to the afternoon session where you have very close meetings with with. with uh, with other patients, with family, and you can maybe be a very active one, but I think you should be at least one of those three, I always tell them. And I think, um, that, so that's more on the patient side. On the other side, we uh, actually, together with Hamilton, we very recently went to the Ministry of, uh, of Health to discuss indeed how we should deal with those expensive treatments. And I think there it's extremely important, because if you, the feeling in the beginning for the patients that they didn't can have abrutinib in first line was, very much an alarming signal while well, we don't get their treatment that we should have and we actually still are very much debating and doubt whether abrutinib for all patients should be the right way in the first line and if you don't work together then then you cannot make a front at all and for this kind of dossiers where it's extremely important to work together uh, we should do it actually more often than we currently do but i think uh, we, we try really to encourage it more so my second question is, are you an exception or are all hematologists, you know, working the same way you do in the Netherlands? Because we hear a lot of wonderful doctors which are extremely patient-centered. But um, I'm, I'm wondering whether you are an exception or whether it's a rule in the Netherlands. No, well, I think it's not kind of a personal choice, but it's more also that for CLL, specific, I don't know, probably it's in all countries, that uh, because we didn't have any drugs for a few years ago, only chlorambucil, that a lot of patients were seen by general internists or by oncologists who see maybe two, three CL patients a year, and for the rest they do their much more prevalent diseases like colon carcinoma. And I think then if you not really in the CL community, you're also pretty much far away from you people, from patient advocacy groups. And as soon as your patient gets more and more to a CL expert or hematology expert, I think it, in most instances they will know their, their patient groups. But Jan, can you comment? Do you think most doctors will recommend going to Hamilton or not? He is one of the few exceptions. Mm. 
That's not good. Uh, okay. Most hematologists and um, all in, in, uh, specialists in internal medicine who treat CLL patients don't tell patients about the patient uh, focusing group. That's my guess. Yes, yeah. that's it. But that's something we should really, yeah, but, but we should work on that. True. True? Yeah. <clears throat> Yes, thanks. I, I just wondered if you could explore a little more this grey zone that we all experience between treating appropriately early and inappropriately late. How long does that go on for, that, that, that time span of, well, I could treat you now, or it's, you're not quite ready, and you know, when, when do things go too far that maybe the the side, the, the, the side effects, the complications of illness have, have, have overweighed the, the therapy. And so, you know, it's not that we miss the boat, but you know, can, you, can you explore that a little bit? Ben, more? can I, I offer a suggestion? Really We've actually run out of time, and uh, I'd like to uh, thank Arnon at the moment and, and, and moving forward. Uh, 